Hello, everybody. Energy poverty is real, but it can be cured. Sit back and enjoy a conversation with one of the world's leading experts in ending energy poverty. NJ Anuk is the executive chairman of the African Energy Chamber, and he is a phenomenal author and industry leading expert. Cyrus Brooks from RBAC and I have an absolute wonderful discussion about how to elevate humanity out of energy poverty. He is a fantastic individual, and I cannot wait for you guys to hear this. And this is the start of a series that we're going to be rolling out, helping articulate what is needed to solve energy poverty. Thank you all. Have Buckle up and enjoy the show. Uh, NJ and Cyrus, thank you for stopping by the podcast, and we are going to have a great discussion. This is about an energy transition done the right way, and NJ, you are an incredible world leader in the energy and ending energy poverty. I am so grateful for you to stop by this podcast. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for having me, sir. It's such an honor. And Cyrus, thank you for putting this together. And, uh, you know, I'm a stalker of both of you guys. I, <laughs> I, I, I just enjoy your work. I've got your other book here. We've got two books, all of the that are going to be in the show notes. And you guys are out leading the charge on telling the world about the energy transition. And Cyrus, you had reached out with some questions uh, a wit to NJ and the African Chamber. What were some of your thoughts on that? Well, you know, NJ is the first guy that I, I really knew that was really telling the story about uh, energy poverty. And um, look, if it, actually, it's really important point. Energy comes from the word from the Greek word energia means activity, right? So the whole idea behind the energy industry is to enable activity now personally um everywhere i've looked it doesn't matter whether it's africa or the united states you know any urban area any depressed economically depressed area the the, the number one thing they want is actually a better standard of living a better life so uh the first time i encountered nj i really started to i saw that i saw that for africa in, and I, I first came here to South Africa in 2016. Uh, you know, I've been here uh, t three times. This is my third time and I've, I've been here for three months. I'm gonna stay here for a while. Uh, and I can really see, you know, everywhere, the, the regular guy, you know, the businessman, you know, at all levels, they actually do want uh, a better life. That's the most important thing, especially when you don't have, or when you really have minimal, like just, you're just barely surviving. That is the number one thing on your mind. And so I really wanted to connect with, with NJ because he's been, uh, what I saw was the most powerful voice uh, for you know alleviating for poverty and also for particularly energy poverty, which is a, an important thing if you're gonna enable the activity, which is gonna enable the economics and economic development. Thank you. Well, what prompted, NJ, what you just said you were talking to OPEC today. You just said that you had these other meetings, but what started you on your mission years ago? Because energy poverty needs to change. What started you on this journey? I tell you this, I was a guy who nobody would believe it. After law school, I used to work for the United Nations. I worked with a lot of very good people, but I realized one thing. No matter the problems we have across Africa, it was all about energy. When there is no energy, you right. cannot face decisions. You can't solve issues like gender-based violence, female genital mutilations, because you got these young girls living in the dark. But also as a kid who grew up in Cameroon in very poor circumstances, education got me out of poverty. 
because my parents were very lucky to work in a mission school that had lights. But everybody around us that was smart, brighter than me, didn't have lights because the church provided us lights. So guess what? They got stuck. They never had a chance. So I thought the mission, faith, and the good old, the best country in the world, America, gave me a chance to have a better life and a great education. And what if I don't use all this knowledge and everything that America gave right. me to reach back to those who need bodies and barriers lifted, those that have been left on the roadside and it became about energy. If I don't do that and I only think about getting that next office on the 20th, on the sixth floor or the 20th floor, then that right. is a poverty and ambition. Then we're not living to that thing that I learned out of United States, the e pluribus unum out of many we become one and we can only become one when we have energy and to look at 600 million people in Africa without access to electricity 900 million without access to clean cooking technologies most of them women and then to turn around and you watch rich people wealthy people that have benefited from natural resources oil natural gas coal and you re that has really been Beautiful, beautiful has improved human civilization, driven human flourishing, make the Western countries the envy of the world with democracy, with rule of law, good governance. Right. Why deny that to the poor, most vulnerable people coming out of Africa? I felt that is unjust, and we need to be a voice of reason for them and let them make their choices, let them use their natural resources to improve their communities. That kind of, that that became the work of my life. How cool, you know. And, and I, I, you're standing up for Africa first, and that to me is the way it should be. And I, I love the way that we're describing this, and that uh, Cyrus, you just brought up that point as well. And that is, we have got to not only let's let what I'm sorry, I get excited about this discussion, and I'm a little irritated because. <laughs> The West comes in and says, we want all your natural resources, but we don't want to leave you jobs. We don't want to have the inner, the technology knowledge transfer. I'm sorry. I'm let's get Africa first. Let's let, every, you know, help you with all of the tech. I think that Cyrus, you talked about this before. Um, we could make a better life for everybody if we had africa first train everybody put the permanent infrastructure in and then charge export fees why don't yep. we have lng factories uh coming out of i believe one just uh, came online on east africa uh west africa and now mm -hmm. it's going to be able to start coming in because we have the geopolitical problems with the red sea everybody's having to come around the cape anyway Let's go ahead and just start exporting LNG and make money permanently for Africa. I agree with that. I think, <laughs> I think I, but still, let's, let's look at it. I'm okay. a free market guy. Okay, there's one thing America teaches you is free markets. And the love for free markets, limited government, and low taxes made that country the greatest economy in the world. Look at this I continent. 1.4 billion people by 2045 it will be 2 billion people imagine wow. you have you are getting lng into 2 billion people that is energy growth that is industrialization that wow. can be the biggest consumers that's why wow. i make the case that our partnership like i always say africa and america is kind of like peanut butter and jelly they get along well because that partnership between Africans, Americans, and Western civilization, it drives us to live up to those true Madisonian or Jeffersonian values that we value the most. If we shift that and don't understand markets, that, that says that America, 350 million people, but it has a number one economy and it can 
we China with, with, with 1.5 billion people. Then you, you move African countries towards China. And that's not the benchmark if you want to have a just right. energy transition. And that track record when it comes to us growth investing in Africa is not there. But then we can go on a super drive. We look at Mozambique. That could go from zero to the third largest producer of energy. So we're not relied on, some, um, on Qatar or, 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 or Russia. We use African gas to power Europe at the same time power in Africa, build pet camps, use American storage facilities, use American technology to drive it, but educate people because you know what? When you educate these people, what happens? They are not busy trying to cross the Mediterranean or try to fly out to go to Mexico to cross borders. They can build right at home. And we're not against renewables, but what we are against is that we see wealthy nations saying, we could take your minerals, we could take your bauxite and your lithium and your platinum and your critical minerals, process it outside and send you the British product. We're saying, build that supply chain right here in Africa. Give these young people a fighting chance to create jobs and opportunities at home and there is already a market here so you're moving here with finance and technology create a supply chain build an infrastructure base and everybody makes money but you do what you do best technology and everything you are still thriving and you have a more balanced system but africans also have a role to play they need to create an enabling environment and i think we have been very very i wouldn't say critical but very forceful in pushing Africans to see that you can open up your systems. Because when you open up your system, like, like you look at Singapore, you look at Guyana, you, 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 look, you look at what some American states that open up their systems, they saw investments coming into those states, and that is what you want to go. Money doesn't have, and business people are like predators, they go where they see benefit, and money is not an emotional issue. It goes where it is welcome. Capital wants to be welcome. Wow. In, you know, um, NJ, you, you said something really uh, great, which was uh, inspired me to ask you more uh, just recently um, and talking about that better, uh, you know, that, that building that, that value add, um, you know, I mean, you don't want to just want, you know, the raw bauxite exported because, you know, that's a very, you know, low level uh, product uh, and, you uh, you know, um, so so you want some uh, value add. You said you said African oil and gas producers should seek to maximize their own capacities as they develop their own subsurface resources. The development process should focus on training for local workers, technology transfers, and investment in related sectors of the economy, including those that can add value to the natural resources themselves, such as refining and petrochemicals. Uh, that was in a post you, you recently mentioned. Yeah. I, I really liked it. I, I wanted to know um, what is what is the scene and where is it happening? And what, what do you see as, uh, what would help it to happen better? Okay, let me answer that with two great examples. Nigeria and Angola some of the, the largest producers in sub-Saharan Africa. Do you know where they refine their crude oil? Their crude oil is being refined in the Netherlands. So they put up the crude oil, send it to the Netherlands, it's refined in, the, in refineries in Europe and sent back to Africa. And so everyday Africans are paying a huge price at the pump. And you know, for example, being American, when the price of the pump is too high, like you have right now, you're losing that election. So what happens in Africa? Everyday people are losing their elections for the struggle for life because of the price of the pump is too high. Second example you're seeing right now, most Africans don't know where Ukraine or Russia is. But they're praying the price for Ukraine and Russia fighting each other. You know why? Because a lot of the wheat and grain and rice that Africans purchase came from that, from that Black Sea and from Ukraine and Russia. So guess what? The question you need to ask yourself is, what did Russia do? as a country to become a superpower in developing in wheat, grain, and agricultural products? It's because right. after the Cold War ended, they imported 80% 
into Russia. They turned that around by using natural gas. This is the power of natural gas. They use that natural gas. They process natural gas built pet camps, a lot of it with American money that was had a lot of goodwill to Russia right after the end of the Cold War. They processed mm -hmm. natural gas, they built urea, ammonia, NPK fertilizer plant, and yep. those are key products to drive up agriculture. Now, turn around to Africa, vast land, vast land in this continent. You take that natural gas, very small scuff, one, TC, one TCF of natural gas, you can turn, build, huge petrochemical plants and then you power agriculture then you you you, you 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 drive up production of food so we don't have to beg for food what happens when you have that you create jobs you feed people you're not begging for aid and waiting for that benevolent that benef that benevolence to come from outside and say oh we need a white knight or a white savior to save people people can then do for themselves what they expect others to do for them it makes families better personal responsibility it it it, it, it shoots up but then you turn around this but there's some good news aliko dankote one of the richest people in the continent has built the world's largest single train um, um refine refine um, refine um, refinery train in nigeria producing 650,000 barrels that is good and i like that you know why you had western capital coming out of black rock coming out of massive western institution back in an african entrepreneur we know the scene and they went out there and did something that has been done nowhere else but in Africa. We're going to see a lot of that and we need to encourage that and we need to nurture that. But also, when we see that kind of success, we need to embrace the American way. We encourage success, not just success, promote it, mm -hmm. celebrate it because it can be infectious. It helps others to come. But then education, we need to focus on that bigly. Namibia has just discovered huge finds being done by Total Energies and Shell and now GAP and you've seen that around Mozambique, South Africa. We need to go on a robust education. But finally, we need to also be bold to stand up against this aid mentality that says that you put a continent on welfare and says we're going to give if you aid, don't develop your, your, your infrastructure, don't develop your things because that's going to help you. You're putting a burden on American taxpayers because they're spending too much of their money trying to give it to aid organizations that are wasting that. Let people here empower themselves. Let them deal with wow. what has to be done. They can do for themselves what that benevolent liberal coming out of America thinks he can do it with his NGO money. It has not helped us. $800 billion of American money spent in Africa over the last 40 years in aid. Where are the results? Einstein says if you keep doing the same thing over and over and expect and you don't get different results, he calls right. insanity. We should, you should be questioning your taxpayers of this insanity with their aid that has been going in a dumping pit. That aid has been bad for Africa. We cut out that aid and empower people with the right kind of investments and technologies. Then you see we unleash the true potential of this continent. I'm sorry, I'm voting for you right now. I think you need to be like the, <laughs> you need to be the world czar right now, man. This is cool. I'm sorry. I'm like this is exactly what needs to happen. I'm yeah. sorry. And, and Jay is so right. I mean, and you also have to, you know, one thing I, I I've been around. I've been around Asia. I've been around uh, you know Africa, and and then I think the one thing that you know the famous do-gooder has as a big fault is that he doesn't see the inherent potential of every single human being and uh, you know if you have any idea that the person because of the color of their skin is it does not is not able to make it then then that is is more racist than any any bad word any bad action you can right. take to someone absolutely I mean, you know, and uh, and if you act that way and if you use government to act that way it's, it's absolutely a suppressive, oppressive thing right. that you could do on a person. So, um, you know, I, mean, I, I would like to see uh, what you think is the biggest potential for for Africans. Where are they winning? Where are they like? Are they are when we're training them? Are they are they winning as petroleum engineers? You know, I mean, I'm meeting some of those. 
I have met some of those in Texas. You know, they find themselves in in Texas, not, not surprisingly. But but where <laughs> where are Africans doing well? Where are they? Where is the education or the training uh, so far? Uh, where, where are they winning? Yes, where, yes, where they are winning. You stand with one right here. There was an old Texan um, sitting in the other store. I don't know if you remember him. Big old guy called Gene Van Dyke. Gene Van Dyke created, created Vanco. He was a wildcat mm -hmm. explorer, park excellence. He hired me, trained me. I mm -hmm. was just a little country lawyer, and he got me knowing what seismic and 3D and all of that stuff in. And I'm right back in Africa, and I'm doing well. And why do I tell you this? A lot of Africans that came out of Exxon and Hess and Marathon and Occidental and many of the American companies that train them, they are doing well not just in oil and gas services, nice. they are doing well in, 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 in government because they came out of these American companies with something that is not found from most places, work ethic. It gives them the work ethic. That 4 a.m. in the 4 a.m. in the morning work ethic and a sense to say it didn't matter where you came from, it didn't matter what community you are, you can still go out there and just be the best. Because this 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 went in there working with American companies, getting American training. This saw rack to rich um, um, stories. So guess what? This year about last week, one of the biggest acquisitions that happened in, an, in the African continent, buying out a big IOC. It became a very American deal. Six African small companies that were just marginal producers got together in the old way of where, where the Americans would merge this acquisition, got together, walked up to Shell, and bought out Shell's activities, some of the activities wow. for $2.5 billion. That's that's where they're winning. Where they're winning is small African companies taking on onshore African gas projects and developing that and providing gas right. in the community. Look at what you see with A2 Energies. Where they're winning, what they, where they're winning is African companies now working with American companies, trading OGX to, to do fracking in sub-Saharan Africa the first time and everything. These were young African kids that were just journeymen and wildcats walking around Oklahoma and Louisiana. They took okay. those skills and those technologies and they brought right here. They're going to take a field from, they're going to take a field that's producing less than a thousand to potentially one thousand within within the next five five years. Where they're winning some of the training schools that are being done today. Tough guys who had worked for Harley Barton, Baker Hughes. They are building some of the best training and development facilities and running them in Senegal, Mauritania. That today they are working on training people on hydrogen technologies around, mm. around oil production and gas productions. There are a lot of success stories, but we don't talk about that. And I intend to make that part of our discussion this year because you need to look up to people who have been successful in your neighborhood and everything. And yep. we just have to understand that that soft bigotry of low expectations, we don't need to embrace that. We need to take that up. And even sometimes we take the hits, we fall down. We got to look up because if you can look up, you can get up. That's something that we've right. seen within we are, we, we, with people who have been successful in the United States. We think we can have that translated into our continent. There is a lot of winning and success mm -hmm. stories. And you know what, um, Cyrus? You just gave me a topic of my next books. I'm going to do a profiling courage from Africans who got in oil and gas and did that. And I write his profiling courage about a few of them. Those stories are going to come out. How cool is that? Um, uh, NJ we're, and Cyrus, we're just about out of time. And I, I cannot wait to be. Let's a, do it again. Absolutely. I can't <laughs> wait to be one of your biggest cheerleaders out here getting your story and you, the message out for you and i can't wait to visit with you again what's coming around the corner for you the chamber and your book uh your your book is just incredible uh, i i can't it's going to be in the show notes but what's coming around the corner for you and we'll close this this edition up but we're going to be back again we're going to be starting a big massive drive because the chokehold on financing into african energy is a big thing 
pressure on fossil fuel companies. The Europe that needs a, a gas the most says natural gas is green, but green for Europe, but not but not for Africa. So we, as the chamber, we're going to be launching a massive effort to bring finance into African energy. So we're going to be reaching out to the United States during Sarah Week, so Mamatsi in Houston during Sarah Week. We're going to be in Paris. We're going to see in, be in London. But even bigger than that, we are going to be doing a big push where with African leaders, bringing them together to understand right. that Africa's right to drill, it's non-negotiable. And I don't apologize for drill, baby, drill. And we're going to continue <laughs> defending our industry like a junkyard dog in the face of a hurricane. I mm -hmm. love it. Well, thank you both, Cyrus. Thank awesome. you. And NJ, I cannot wait to see you guys and visit with you again. And we will have all this in the show notes. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much. Such an honor. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Derek.